I'm here today with Dr. Walter Earl Fluker. Walter is Dean's Professor of Spirituality, Ethics, and Leadership at the Candler School of Theology. He is Professor Emeritus of Ethical Leadership at Boston University, having served as the Martin Luther King Professor of Ethical Leadership from 2010 to 2020. He was founding executive editor of the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership and was the Coca-Cola Professor of Leadership Studies at Morehouse College. Known as an expert in the theory and practice of ethical leadership, Walter is an internationally known consultant, speaker, lecturer, and workshop leader. He's the author of several books, including The Ground Has Shifted, The Future of the Black Church in Post-Racial America, and Ethical Leadership, The Quest for Character, Civility, and Community. He is also the editor of the multi-volume series, The Papers of Howard Washington Thurman, and also Educating Ethical Leaders in the 21st Century. Walter developed a massive online operating course, also known as MOOC, entitled Ethical Leadership, Character, Civility, and Community that reached over 14,000 participants around the globe. You can learn more about Walter at WalterEarlFluker.com. So Walter, it's really uh, quite an honor and privilege to have you here with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian, for inviting me. Well, um, you know, I just kind of touched on, you know, a few of the highlights of your background, but could you fill that in a little bit more for folks? Yeah, I shared with you earlier, I was born in Mississippi. I was raised in Illinois. <laughs> I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and I grew up uh, in a neighborhood where the people didn't live so good, <laughs> where the rooms were small. Oscar Brown Jr. used to say, and the buildings are made of wood. That's not quite true for the south side of Chicago. But I attended Chicago public schools and was drafted into the military after high school, served as a chaplain's assistant, uh, came back home and attended college, a little uh, evangelical college in Chicago, Trinity College, Deerfield, Illinois. Mm. Later went on to uh, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary where the great James Cone had, um, had studied. I studied with the likes of uh, Rosemary Ruther and just so many great liberation theologians who were around in those days and was shaped, profoundly shaped by my experiences both at Trinity and at Garrett, Garrett being in the heart of Northwestern University. Yes, yes. In Illinois. So I had a chance to study uh, with professors within the university, one being the late Sterling Stuckey, who really shaped my consciousness, uh, especially around Pan-Africanism, and was very helpful in pointing me in certain directions. You should know it's also while I was at uh, Garrett, that I first uh, met Howard Thurman. Hmm. I had become acquainted with Thurman while a chaplain's assistant in 1972 or three, I was the post chaplain's clerk. And part of my responsibility at the main chapel was to take care of the bulletins for each Sunday. <laughs> and the chaplain, Alfred Brogue, I think is, is Brogue, uh, he would use these meditations and I could not wait until for each week to see which meditation there would be. And one day I explored the name and found a book, The Centering Moment, and there was this beautiful smiling face of this African-American gentleman. And for me in the early 70s, at least I had not been exposed to uh, people like Thurman. Mm. And uh, so that was my first meeting. But later at Garrett, he was invited to come for a convocation on his work. And I was the student invited to pick him up at the airport. Oh, my. How cool. And uh, talking about uh, serendipity, chirotic moments, all of the things we get. It, for me, was just a watershed uh, moment for me. I landed and we sat for lunch uh, in the uh, company of my fiance, whom I did not know at the time. I knew she knew Thurman, her family knew Thurman, but I did not know at the time the deep, long relationship of Thurman to uh, my beloved's family. 
Wow. And so this this was serendipitous, quite frankly, serendipitous. And Thurman asked me two or three questions at lunch. He said, who are you? He loved to ask people. <laughs> He said, and you know, I said, I'm, 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 and he said, I see. He said, and what do you want? <laughs> I said, well, you know, I'd like to go on and become a citizen of the world, a moral force, and say, you know, the naivete of uh, that stage of, of your development, right? And he just sat there looking. And then he looked back again. He said, but who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I write about that. I don't need to overstate it here, but uh, it was shaking me in some mm -hmm. very deep places. Mm -hmm. And later this uh, time with Thurman uh, translates into opportunities to study with him mm -hmm. as part of a Lilly uh, funded program entitled Footprints of the Disinherited, mm -hmm. some of Thurman's very favorite language. And I was uh, one of 10 uh, students who had made commitments to the religious life who were invited to spend a week with him in San Francisco. Wow. Part of this program. And I can tell you, I was changed forever. Mm -hmm. It was so profound. There were six uh, men and four women who were part of that. And we were moved into the world of this um, wise old sage we did not know that he might you know he would have had about three more years left okay. and he sat with us and i write about this brian and then i'll tell you about bu in the books but this is this is incredible he sat with us all morning the first morning reading the gospel of mark he says this is the oldest of the gospels and I want to read it for you. And I want you to imagine that you're somewhere else, maybe in a cafe in France, or you're sitting uh, on a park bench and a stranger comes along and tells you this story. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I was shaken by this. Hmm. Uh, hmm. And so were others because all I could hear and feel in that moment, in that long morning, we even took a break during the reading of the Gospel of Mark, uh, was that Jesus was a radically free man and that everything Jesus touched was freed up mm -hmm. to live authentically, to be who who they were. That, that's, that's, that was my, and I took, of course, notes and I've written about that, but that was my first profound, teaching moment with Howard Thurman. And again, that moment changed me and others who were there, I think for me forever. I had no idea then that I would one day go on to become the editor of his paper. No idea whatsoever. Wow, wow. But I did complete my work at Garrett in 1980 and Boston University accepted me as a PhD student. There's a, there are layers of stories, of course, uh, in between there. And Thurman was a very important part of that decision to go mm. to BU. Mm. And so I arrive at BU. I study with a Martin Luther King Jr. professor of social ethics, a chair I would later occupy <laughs> years later, having no idea, just young, this on an adventure, on a quest, trying to find whatever was beckoning me. I think that's the way I saw it then, you know, but whatever was calling me, I was looking for it too. And uh, at BU, uh, uh, just marvelous, uh, Sharon, my, my now my wife, uh, we were married. She came after completing her PhD at Northwestern and became part of the Harvard Kennedy School. And while she was there across the river, I was at BU, and lo and behold, Howard Thurman dies, and his uh, beloved wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, sends all of his papers that she knew of at the time to Boston University. Wow. Wow. And um, of course, I couldn't wait to be get into the papers, and they were not organized. And uh, I went through every box I could. Uh, 
And when I'm saying boxes, I'm telling you there's 75 uh, cubic, what do they call square cubicle feet of boxes. There's a lot. Aye. I went through uh, these boxes, these old notes, but they were not organized. But I went back to my professor and I said, I would like to write a dissertation on Howard Thurman. He laughed and he said, you know, that's a noble idea, Walter, but there's not enough in Thurman to justify a dissertation. Oh, my. I knew better, <laughs> but you learn early for all uh, PhD candidates and folks who are in that position. Please learn to be shrewd and pragmatic. You don't have to win every battle <laughs> <laughs> if you really have a goal. But I did to, uh, he did tell me he wanted me to maybe do a dissertation on Thurman and King. He was mm. the King chair. Uh, Boston University was the place where Martin Luther King Jr. finished his PhD work. Mm. And then I began to see this interesting relationship between Thurman and King. Both were Morehouse men, both were sons of the South, and their orbits were so familiar. So I ended up uh, completing a dissertation on um, a comparative analysis mm -hmm. of the ideal of community in the thought of Howard Thurman and Martin Luther King Jr., wow. Wow. which has been my blueprint. There, You'll hear me say serendipitously a lot. Uh, I love synchronicity as well. These are just features of my journey because I never quite know where I am. And um, but this became the blueprint uh, for nearly everything I've done since. And this, this uh, the idea of community growing out of certainly a very eclectic appropriation of intellectual sources for both uh, of these figures, but certainly coming out of African-American uh, ch uh, churchly and moral traditions. This is just incredible. So uh, making a long story short, I completed that while pastoring a church and Sharon and I moved uh, with our new baby son to New Orleans where I served as Dean of the Chapel at Dillard University, mm, mm. a chapel that Thurman dedicated in 1955, great historically <laughs> black college and university. And Sharon was assistant professor of political science. From there, we left and we went to Vanderbilt. And while at Vanderbilt, I had completed my dissertation and I began working on my first book, which was the dissertation they looked for a city. And that was Howard Thurman and Martin Luther King Jr. on community. After Vanderbilt, Sharon and I were off again. We, we were in Cambridge at Harvard. I was teaching at the college, as I suggested to you earlier. And um, she was then at the African-American, the Du Bois Institute, um, and working as an administrative fellow for Derek Bach and later for Ronald Thiemann. Mm -hmm. That was in the early 90s, and out of the blue, I hope you don't mind these long stories, but I know it's so fascinating. I mean, you've been and it so gives me a chance to remember stories. my life. I'm trying to remember <laughs> what was going on. But in the 90s, some inter interesting things began to happen for me. And at one point when I was locked into the academic protocol of the university, you know, you don't talk about such things, right? Because you have certain standing especially if you're in Cambridge and you have a pipe. And <laughs> um, in the early 90s, I began to just pick up stuff and couldn't quite figure out where to place it. For instance, I would go into a bookstore and I would kind of know where to, where to look and feel. I can't tell you, who, oh, and it's not spooky to me anymore, it's, but I would just walk in I remember once I had a dream uh, that I couldn't figure out. I go to a bookstore in Cambridge and I, I grab a book on Nordic uh, folk tales, <laughs> Thor and Loki, you know, stuff I didn't really know much about. And I read it and there was the very dream that I had. So synchronicity is huge for me. Wow. And so while in Cambridge, this begins to happen. One of the great, uh, uh, events for me that shaped 
the course or the trajectory of the rest of my work was that uh, while in Cambridge, uh, I was invited by the Ford Foundation to serve as an evaluator for doctoral fellowships. Hmm. I taught a course, exhausted, went home, took a nap before boarding a plane, and I have this incredible dream. It just blew me away. It was the dream of a little guy who took a book from two of us. There were two of me or something, and they and it it, it ran into a cave. I couldn't figure that out to save my life. It was driving me crazy. <laughs> I, I never had anything so vivid and so Im emotionally impactful. So I'm on the hmm. plane trying to figure it out. I get to the meeting that night, the reception, and there is a gentleman. I'm sitting next to him who's also an evaluator. He happens to be a Jungian analyst. So I said, man, have you ever heard a dream like this? You know, I'm trying to ease it in on him. <laughs> And he gives me this great, and I said, wow. So I'm struggling with this. And then later during this meeting, my point is, I'm at a reception. I'm very uncomfortable, even to this day, at receptions mm -hmm. or public spaces. And again, I know it's childhood stuff, but I'm not not very comfortable with all of the blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, and and how do you hold your drink and give somebody a card? <laughs> I, I just hate stuff like that. And so I'm, I'm there saying, boy, I'm going to leave. And I get ready. I walk out. I grab my coat. And my heart says, go back in. So I go back mm -hmm. in. And there uh, I, I'm standing there. And a woman comes from across the room. And she said, I've been noticing you. Uh, how are you? My name is uh, Sharon. I said, wow, my name is uh, Walter Fluker. My wife's name is Sharon. She looked at my name tag. She said, Sharon Fluker? <laughs> yes. She said, oh, please give her my best, so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. And this woman, much like the dream, just walked me over to a crowd of people, and they asked me what kind of work I was doing. And I told them about Thurman and King stuff I've told you, and that I was writing another book, really looking at how the traditions that they were part of shaped their understanding of community and justice. One of the women who happened to be in a Harvard alum and knowing that I was teaching at Harvard that semester said, wow, you need to talk with the Kellogg Foundation. <laughs> I knew that Kellogg made great cereal. <laughs> I had no idea that they had a foundation. Long story short, I'm invited while I've submitted a proposal to do uh, some work in ethical leadership, I picked this language up from that conversation, by the way, and Kellogg was interested in leadership. I had submitted a proposal and was simultaneously invited to give the King Day sermon or lecture at Tuskegee University mm. in Alabama. Mm. Wouldn't you know that the whole board of the Kellogg Foundation would be there on a visitation? Oh, my goodness. They were exploring some opportunities with this. So I preached to the. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> and I hang out with them for dinner. Wow. And I get to know them. And all I can tell you, Brian, is that one year later, I received the grant of $990,000 to study ethical leadership from African-American moral traditions. Wow. So I began that work at Colgate Rochester Divinity School. Then I'd left Harvard with all my money and I went to uh, uh, Colgate Rochester as Dean of Black Church Studies and the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor there. <laughs> so, so these guys have been following me around and uh, <laughs> nudging me into places I don't really want to go most of the time. And uh, I was there for until 1996. And similarly, uh, Morehouse College calls me and asked me to consult. A new president came on board, Walter Earl Massey, or Walter Edward Massey, I think his name. But he was just a brilliant, wonderful human man, a human being. They invite me, he and John Hobbs, to consult on the construction of a new leadership center 
at Morehouse College, the mm -hmm. alma mater to Martin and to Howard. And uh, I accept, I move, my family and I moved to Atlanta and we, uh, we construct a multi-million dollar center on the campus of Morehouse, <laughs> which becomes a laboratory for the 13 years I was there. It was like a laboratory for experimenting with what I had learned while I was at Colgate Rochester and the curriculum that I had developed around ethical leadership, which became part of a book that I published in 2009 and which gave me audiences, uh, certainly at Boston University, where I'd received the PhD in 1988. I never finished that conversation. I got too involved in the real story. But um, I'm invited back after this work at Morehouse. But by then, I've already started uh, doing work really around the globe. I'm invited by the State Department to lecture in China two different uh, occasions in India, talking about ethical leadership. And of course, uh, sometimes that's seen as US propaganda, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I had some fascinating experiences and I probably learned more than uh, I taught. Um, but later in South Africa, it just opened like a, a, a blooming field for me. Mm. Oprah Winfrey and I were at dinner one night because of Morehouse College and Walter Massey, not because of Walter Fluker. And um, she said, well, what do you want to do, Dr. Fluker? <laughs> I said, I would like to take uh, these young men and the women at Spelman College across the street and Clark AU, I'd like to take them to South Africa and uh, have them work with uh, similar young emerging leaders on the ground. Uh, maybe doing work with HIV and AIDS, mm. which was very prevalent in South Africa at that point and here. And so we developed a program, uh, a kind of a bilateral program where we would go to South Africa, the young uh, students would work with students there caring for AIDS patients and especially uh, uh, young uh, children in orphanages that had been um, you know, overcome by this dreadful disease. And they would go there, then the South African students would come here. It was a great exchange funded by Oprah Winfrey, who that night dropped a check to Dr. Massey for $5 million to get it started. Oh my goodness. This is the greatness of people like Oprah Winfrey, you know, beyond all of the other stuff on camera, just a great heart, you know, I always wow. remember that. And of course, the State Department and uh, invested a lot in this work. And it was a powerful moment for me. And I would have stayed at Morehouse forever, except one day I'm driving down I-20. And I had the strangest sense of something, knowledge. If we ever get the words right, we'll probably be a long way on this spirituality uh, path. But it was like a knowing. I knew I was going to Boston. I knew I, was <laughs> I come home, I tell my wife that, and she, are you, are you out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Lord. And lo and behold, I'm on one of these trips to South Africa during the summer. My youngest son, Hampton, who has completed high school, is looking for places to go. <laughs> I was convinced he would be a Morehouse man, like his brother Clinton, <laughs> because Morehouse had certain faculty benefits, if you get my drift. And uh, while I was away, Sharon and Hampton, in biblical ways, conspired against me. <laughs> <laughs> there are some examples. <laughs> and Hampton decided to go to Boston University. <laughs> Before. <laughs> anyway, so when I get back, Hampton has already decided on BU. And uh, Sharon said, and you're going to go with him to his orientation. <laughs> I go there to the orientation. 
And in full disclosure, I must let you know, I had already served on the advisory board for the for the dean of the School of Theology as an alum, et cetera. But there was a new dean, Mary Elizabeth Moore. I dropped by our office while I'm there with Hampton to introduce myself. And she said, wow, uh, Walter, are you aware that the Martin Luther King Jr. chair is over? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I shouldn't have to say more than that. So I end up at BU, uh, Hampton gets a very good ride. And is really a, a you know a fairly uh, well known actor right now. He's kind of growing <laughs> in many ways. But the beauty of it all is that uh, these this is the way the journey happens for me now. So uh, when we work with uh, leaders in the ethical leadership uh, curriculum, uh, we the first one of the first exercises is to help leaders remember, retail and relive their story. But always remembering, retelling, and reliving one's story within the larger social historical context. There is no story without history and no story that is worth mentioning unless one can see how personal formation is related to a larger social historical script mm -hmm. or narrative that uh, in many ways determines performance, informs performance. So my formula for, for the uh, folks who love big words and thoughts uh, is how does one's habitus really situate one, set one up for certain kinds of ways of being and being shaped? This can be very terrible, can be very nice, but we come here I think without our consent, as the old folks says, and we leave against our wills, at least most of us. <laughs> so we really don't have as much autonomy as we think. That's the point. And every now and then we have a chance to peek through an aperture of something that is beautiful. I'd like to think that is holy, but it can also be a peek into the abyss, something that is terrible terrifying, mysterious at tremendum, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but most of us come not even being aware of what journey we're on. Mm -hmm. So to remember one story is to always go back, play with these early memories, and to name them, identify them, and then ask critical questions about vision, which helps you to reframe the narrative you know so i retell my story how do i reconstruct my narrative is so important for everybody but especially for people who are in leadership roles because often we show up with so much stuff that is informing our behavior and we want to be authentic but we don't even know how to be <laughs> and and we're caught in so many scripts that have been written for us before we arrive so I go back to people like Thurman and I say, well, who are you? <laughs> really? That's great. So that's part, that's part of the uh, work I do, uh, especially now in places where I teach uh, in, in, in the academy, but also with Walter or Fluker and Associates. Uh, this is a company I've had on the books, but did not activate until retirement in 2020. And so if you go to WalterEarlFluker.com, uh, you'll see at this point a developing website, which is fairly uh, informative. Uh, but we hope that by uh, March of this year, certainly by April, uh, you'll be able to go in and uh, walk through uh, many of the products and offerings that we are making to people. I have a great cadre of folks who uh, are working with me as trainers of trainers. And our goal is to create ethical leadership in local communities. Mm. And we bring together spirituality, ethics, and leadership. Ethics out there by itself can uh, do some very strange things. <laughs> Uh, spirituality for us, which can also do some very strange things, 
Uh, but we use spirituality as a kind of anchor. And of course, you know, I get much of that from the work with Thurman. Uh, but I'm reading, I'm constantly reading other folks. Like I love Barbara Brown Taylor. <laughs> Each time I see her, I, I get an opportunity. I said, you know, I love you and Ed together, but I love you a little more, Barbara. <laughs> Because she drives, she drives home for people who are on the this path of of alternative spiritualities, uh, opportunities to self reflect, again back upon one's own space, which is intensely personal, but never being satisfied with the personal being the only guide, to always be aware that around you. You know, there's a whole lot going on <laughs> outside of your very myopic vision of yourself, narcissistic vision often of yourself. And we all suffer with that. Uh, there is an incredible universe that is going on forever. <laughs> and to be aware of that, I think helps leaders, one, with any issues related to integrity, certainly humility. But I think humility comes with being aware of just how small we are and how unknowing we are and how it, uh, we are always at the mercy of a very precarious universe. To know that delicately made the you know, Psalms 139, fearfully and delicately, wonderfully made, um, keeps you in a space of humility and gratitude. So spirituality becomes an incredible anchor. And we have the cutest little version, you know, of this. This is uh, my ethical leadership model that I use. It's in uh, the ethical leadership book. But in the massive online open course, this is a graphic that dances. <laughs> it does all kinds of things and it shows uh, the kind of virtues, values, and virtuosities we use for, for leaders. That's about all I'll say about ethical leadership, um, except that I really invite uh, listeners to contact us again at Walter O. Fluker dot com as a way of getting a sense of what it is we are offering because that's all i really want to do now at this point mm. is to engage people in local communities and uh, conduct train the trainer uh, workshops so that we can certify people in this this program and again it's uh it's not a money maker for me so uh Whatever uh, pricings we come up with, we're still working on that. In all uh, honesty, it'll be accessible for various communities. Writings. Are you interested in writings now? I know that was one of my agenda items or what? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Walter Thurman series mm -hmm. of books that you've written, but also the upcoming conference. Oh, yeah. Out. In April, I'd love for you to share about that. Two things about that. One is I'm teaching a course on Howard Thurman. It is entitled Howard Thurman Spirituality and Community. It will be offered this spring, 2022, from January the 12th through April the 20th. It is virtual, online, and you can access it by going to Candler uh, School of Theology, which is on the Emory University website. I don't have the link before me right now, uh, but it's, it's a course that is open to students, regular students uh, in the university and the School of Theology. And it's also open to community participants. Mm -hmm. And it's a virtual audience. So last year we had 70 students in the course. I suspect this year that we'll have that or more. A lot of people are registering for the course. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm assisted by the Foundry at Emory. That's another name you can use to, uh, to find the course for community participants. 
We're assisted by the foundry and we have course assistants who will be working one-on-one -on -one with different groups, which we call communities of discourse and practice around Thurman. Mm -hmm. So uh, please uh, get involved with that. This course is also part of a major initiative, which will is part of a conference that will take place April 8th through the 9th of this year, 2022, right before Palm Sunday, uh, right before Thurman's, the anniversary of Thurman's death. Thurman died on April 10th, 1981. This conference is organi organized around three themes, spirituality and social transformation, ways in which we understand uh, church and non-church participation in public life is a simple way of saying, we, we call it ecclesial and non-ecclesial interfaith practices, but <laughs> really how we understand uh, this idea of spirituality, congregations, communities within public life and uh, some incredible speakers uh, whom I'll name in a minute. And the third theme has to do with Thurman's interpretation of democratic life and practices, which is incredibly timely and relevant for our nation and I think for the world right now. The first uh, session on spirituality and social transformation will be keynoted by Luther E. Smith, a name that many people who read Thurman know. Uh, and he will be in dialogue with Greg Ellison, who is also at Emory and has written on Thurman, and Shively Smith from Boston University, who has written on Thurman. The second session, one of my favorite human beings in the whole wide world is Barbara Brown Taylor. She will keynote uh, the uh, second session on church or whatever we, we mean when we say church or maybe leaving church or finding altars <laughs> in the world. I, I don't know, you know, where <laughs> wants to go with that. And she will be joined in conversation by the head of uh, Emory's uh, Buddhist Center for Contemplation and Compassion, Lobsong Negri, who is an uh, incredible uh, Buddhist monk associated with the Dalai Lama. Uh, and also with Amanda K. Brown, who has written what I think is the most complete historical analysis of the Fellowship Church in San Francisco, which was Thurman's experiment, one of his experiments in ecclesiology. Mm. And the uh, third session is on that Friday. And I, uh, along with Peter Eisenstadt, my co-editor right now, and the biographer, of Thurman, his book is Hounds of Hell. He and I will be engaged in talking about Thurman's vision of democracy. That session is entitled America in Search of a Soul. Mm. Uh, apropos given today's address by the president, I think very apropos. The um, conference will also include an exhibition of all of the resources that are available at Emory University and Candler School of Theology and their libraries. We have an incredible digital collection. And we also house the election, uh, collections of Sue Bailey Thurman's family, which is quite a remarkable family, historical family. And last but not least, there will be a liturgical performance on that Thursday, uh, the, on that Friday, the 8th, at five o'clock, uh, Jimmy Abington and Kalia Williams will be engaged in a liturgical performance which will highlight uh, Howard Thurman's understanding of worship and liturgy, especially utilizing his understanding of the Black Madonna, mm -hmm. his experiments with Madonnas in churches and chow, mm -hmm. and uh, an interpretation of Thurman's uh, writings on the Negro spiritual speak of life and death. Mm, mm. Uh, it's a full conference and I'm inviting everybody who is remotely interested uh, to please take a part in this. We would love to have you present. Now, will that all be recorded? Uh, yes, it will be recorded. And 
if God is my helper, uh, I will make uh, the proceedings available in some kind of print and uh, digital space. Good, good, good. So if people want to find out more about that conference, um, they could just go to the um, Candler or Emory website and search Absolutely. for it? Absolutely. Okay. And if I had been a more astute uh, interviewee, I would have brought the stuff with me. Well, I'll, I'll search for it and I'll include it in the notes of this uh, interview. If I, you know, right. You know. uh, Demelia Sacristi is the point person on this uh, conference that uh, you'll want to be in touch with, along with myself. I'm simply wfluker at emory.edu. Wonderful. I'm easy, easy to get to. So um, this has just been really an outstanding conversation, Walter. I appreciate so much you sharing all of your background, all of the fascinating serendipity, as you said, um, that has impacted your life and, and all of your accomplishments. Um, thanks so much for, uh, for sharing that with us and uh, really wish you the best uh, for this conference. Well, you know, I'm, I'm old like you, Brian. We can, it's great to sit down and remember stuff, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, as Southsiders, you know, uh, <laughs> have to stick together, right? <laughs> I don't know about your time, but you had mentioned earlier about books. And uh, I've written several things that you've already kind of sort of alluded to, but now I'm working more, they're not really memoirs, it's collections of writings that I've always wanted to complete. Okay, good. And, um, much of it is poetry. Hmm. It is both poetry and uh, prose on different angles of vision that speak to this uh, journey of spirituality, ethics, and leadership. So um, I'm hoping that I can have that to the public by the end, hopefully, if God is my helper, by the end of this year. Oh, good, 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 good. Well, you know, let me know, keep in touch, and, you know, we'll uh, maybe do an interview about those books when they uh, come out. And it shall come to pass. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, again, you can find out more about all of Walter's work at WalterEarlFluker.com and uh, check out the uh, Howard Thurman Conference at uh, Emory University coming up April 8th and 9th. Yes. Walter, thank you again so much. God bless you and stay in the light. <laughs>